Good morning. I want to ask you a question today as we begin, and that question is, why is vulnerability so hard? Like, you might think that you're the only one who struggles with it, but I just want to encourage you, you're not. From the very beginning, all of us started in the same place. We were born into this world. Everybody called us cute, whether we were or not. <laughs> and, and we had this hunger to connect. From the time we were born, we were hungry to connect with people. We looked for affirmation from our parents or our caregivers. We, we were longing for relationships. But somewhere along the way, it became difficult to let people in. It became difficult to, to give other people enough information to know us and be scared they weren't going to use that information to hurt us. And, and I've been uh, doing this thing for long enough to know that people of every age and life stage, people of every economic level, people of every uh, educational level struggle with vulnerability. And I think part of the reason that we struggle with vulnerability is our past experience. We've opened up, we've shared, and we've experienced the beauty of that connecting us deeply with people. And we've also opened up and shared and given people that access, and they've used it to hurt us. I had one of those experiences several years ago. We invited a couple over to our house. He was working with me at the time. I did not know his wife as well, but I figured we would have a good connection. And so we had this beautiful meal, had a great time, moved into the living room. You always know that you want them to stay around longer if you leave from one room and go to the next, you know? Okay, these are, these are our people. And we're talking at the, at, the, at the couches, and I don't remember how we got on this conversation, but I just shared about a weakness of mine. And I said, you know, I just get caught up sometimes I get like tunnel vision and I can be more task oriented and so I'm just going to get those things done. But sometimes that means that at the cost of getting things done, people feel like they're unimportant because I'm so caught up in the task. And, and the wife was sitting over there kind of quiet. And then she looked at me and she says, do you know what you do? And I was like, no, but I'm pretty sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> And she did. She said, you will be so caught up in whatever you're doing or the one person you need to talk to that you'll come into the room, you'll talk to that one person, and then leave without acknowledging there were actually 20 people in the room. She said, my husband will be that person, and I'll be standing right next to him, and it will be as if I don't exist. I felt about this small. And the problem was she was not wrong. She was actually dead on. That was my weakness. And so a few months later, I was preparing to preach a message at that church I was serving. Not, not this church, it was a previous church. And, and I was getting ready to, to work on this message, and it was almost done. I said, what's missing is a story. A story of, of what this looks like and what it doesn't look like. And I go, you know what, I'm going to tell this story. Because I try to tell stories on a regular basis that work against the natural way this works. Because the natural way this works is I'm actually higher up than you right now. I'm, a, I'm on this platform. For some of you, I'm really big on your 80-inch TV at home. And the problem with that is that that leads you to put me on a pedestal. And so I try to tell stories not where I'm the hero, but where I'm the zero. Where I'm not the hero, but the villain. Because if you try to put me on a pedestal, my goal is to climb off as fast as I can. Because I'm not the hero of this sermon. Jesus is. But sometimes the way these lights work and the cameras work and the platform works is that it, it puts me bigger than I am. So I got ready to tell this story in that sermon. And I told this story and told her what she said. And I talked about the importance of how you keep people in your life to tell you the things you don't need to hear. And the next morning, I got into work, and I had an email waiting for me. And it wasn't one of those, Scott, that was a great message. Thank you for helping me. It was not, hey, thank you so much for writing that message and spending all that time in the commentaries. Here's some money to Starbucks. No, it wasn't that. It was an email from the guy who was over all of the greeters in our church, the first impression team. 
And his email began, Scott, I was so gratified to hear your story yesterday. Gratified? Like of all the words to choose. He said, I was so gratified to hear your story because I have seen you do that so many times. And then he began to list all of the ways and the times that I had done that. And if you could have seen a picture of my heart that day, it was torn into a thousand pieces. Because I said, why ever be vulnerable again? Why open up and share? Why try to help people if they're going to use what you give them to hurt you? Friends, that's the challenge of vulnerability. That's the reason why some of you refuse to be vulnerable or struggle with it. Because in your heart, you're trying to connect. But what ends up happening is far from connection. Now, we're talking about the challenge of vulnerability today because we're in a series called Find Your People, Developing Healthy Relationships in a Lonely World. And if you missed last week's message, I'd encourage you to go back and watch it on our website. We talked about the, the pandemic of loneliness and isolation that is present in our world, that, that has affected all of us and that is only increasing in its size and impact. And I think that one of the biggest barriers or obstacles to developing healthy relationships in a lonely world, because that's the subtitle here, is the challenge of vulnerability. And so I want to help you navigate and overcome that obstacle today. So here's the big idea if you're taking notes. The relationships that we want are on the other side of conversations we're avoiding. The, the, the sense of connection, the healthy relationships, the, the knowing and being known, the having people that are your people, those relationships that we want and crave in our soul, they are on the other side of conversations that we're just not willing to have. And we see the beginning of this struggle, not in the 70s, not in the 50s, not in Europe, not even in this millennia. We see the beginning of this struggle all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to open up to either the first page or the second page, depending on how big your font is. And we're going to be in Genesis 3. Now, a little bit of background. In Genesis 2, we see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And in the middle of Genesis 2, God gives them a command. He says, you can do anything you want in this garden except for one thing. You cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At the end of chapter 2, we read that Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were naked. I would say they were vulnerable but they were without shame. Then we get to Genesis chapter 3, and as some of you know, everything changes. Beginning in verse 6, this is what we read. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took it, some of its fruit, and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The reason you have a struggle with vulnerability is not because of the family you grew up in, although that may be part of the struggle. Maybe you grew up in a family that didn't show emotion and nobody was honest. The reason you struggle with vulnerability is not because you had an unhealthy dating relationship in your teens or 20s and that person hurt you. The reason you struggle with vulnerability is not because you moved from somewhere where you had tons of friends and now you live here and you're starting over. The reason why you struggle with vulnerability is because Genesis 3, 6 through 10 happened and sin entered the world. And after the fall, we started a pattern 
that we've been repeating for thousands of years. What is that, this pattern? Well, I'm going to show it to you. I don't have notes. I don't have points for you today. One, two, three, four. So for those of you who are used to that, just this is a different day. But I do want you to draw something with me. And it's this four-part pattern. The first part of the pattern is that we pull away. This is what we see happen in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they pull away from God. And it's been our our gravitational pull ever since. If I jump up right now, I'm coming back to earth. That's, That's gravity. But the same way, there is a gravity at work that we pull away from God when we sin, which is pretty regularly for most of us. We pull away, and then we feel shame. This is what Adam said. We were naked, so we hid because we were afraid. Well, they were naked a few verses before this in chapter 2. It wasn't like they suddenly were not more naked. What changed? Shame. Nakedness moved from something that you had without shame. It now was something when you had it, you realized it, and you were ashamed of it. They felt exposed. The third part of the pattern is that we fear pain. He says, we were, and we were afraid, so we hid. We were afraid of pain. That's, 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 that's why we pull back. We don't want to get hurt. And the final one is we, we build bigger barriers. They had not had clothes before. And yet they found the ingredients for their first barrier in the garden with the fig leaves. And they put up a barrier between them and each other. And then they hid from God. And this is a pattern that goes on for thousands of years between Adam and Eve and us. This is for many of us our pattern with God. We pull away from God when something happens. We feel ashamed because we feel broken, unworthy, unlovable. We fear pain in the future because of this, so we build a barrier. The problem isn't just we go through this once. We go through this again and again. That's where the bigger comes in. That over time, the barriers get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And for some of you, you are really good at this. You have like your own castle built with walls and a moat and everything. And it's the barrier between you and God because of all the shame you feel over what has happened in the past. And there's this huge struggle for you to be vulnerable with God. But here's the thing. The same storyline that plays out with God, it also plays out with how we relate to each other. This pattern here isn't just a us and God individually pattern. This is a pattern of us with each other. Not sure if you've noticed, but relationships don't stay static. If you don't work on any relationship, it is not naturally, when you come back to it, going to be better, stronger, more intimate. It's going to pull away. And so many of our friendships with people, there's shame because we're afraid of, oh my gosh, what would happen if they found out this thing? That fear, that feeling of shame fuels a fear of what happens if they were to figure it out, and so we build barriers. And some of you, though it's invisible, we can't see it, every day in your life, you live in a castle. And it's a beautiful castle, but you're all in there alone. And no one can get through your castle and your moat to get to you. Because you live in a broken, sinful world. You feel shame over that sin. And you fear what would happen if someone actually got close enough to see that and know that. And some of us, the challenge is that we've seen this pattern play out and we've tried to be vulnerable, but it hasn't worked out like like my story did. We risked with somebody, we shared something, and, and they, they responded in a way that was far from helpful, that was actually hurtful. Here's where I want to turn to my, my door here. You may be wondering, why, why is there a door on the stage? Well, we, we're at a performing arts center. It's beautiful. I just call somebody in the week, and that door appears on Sunday morning. It's, it's great. But there's a door here, and, and this door is, I think, symbolic of how a lot of us live. 
this door is going to stand in for our castle. That a lot of us have kind of built up a, a wall, a door, to keep certain things out of our lives. And you say, Scott, what are the things we keep out? Well, there may be a point in life where you felt not heard. You tried to share, you tried to open up, but the person didn't hear you. Or maybe they didn't hear you the way that you wanted to be heard. And so you go, man, I don't want to feel that way again. Maybe you felt misunderstood. You tried to help, but then you got your, your hand slapped. You tried to open up, but they misunderstood your intentions. Now you feel pretty disillusioned because you're like, what's the point of all that? Well, why go through all that if that's how people are going to respond to me? Or maybe worst of all, you, you feel betrayed. Like with me, I opened up and shared and somebody used that vulnerability as you know, fuel to dump on that shame fire. And so what a lot of us do, we say, hey, there's all these things that I never want to feel again. Like, at the end of the day, I don't want to be hurt again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all these things out here, and I'm going to go live behind my locked door. That way, none of that stuff can ever get in my life ever again. I'm never going to allow that in ever again. And you make that decision, you very well may get what you want that you never get hurt again. You may win, but here's the problem. A locked door keeps everything out. It's not just the stuff you think you're going to keep out. There's actually other stuff. And C.S. Lewis says this better than I can. He says, love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. So you start with the best of intentions and protect yourself and keep out all the hurt. The problem is that you didn't realize in keeping the hurt out, you inadvertently kept other things out too. If the door is locked, and you're also going to keep out real connection. Because how can people connect to you if there's a giant wall up and they can't get in? And you keep out encouragement. Because how can I encourage you if I don't know what you're struggling with or what's going on or what your needs are? You, you keep out feeling seen and heard. Because how can I see you if you're behind this locked door? And maybe you're struggling and you need some help and you need some accountability, but how can I hold you accountable if I don't even know what to hold you accountable to or for? See, the problem is, is if you decide you want to keep hurt out, you will inevitably also end up keeping love out. You thought there was only one bucket there, in front of that locked door. Turns out, there's lots of buckets. And if hurt can't get in, nothing can get in. And that's why I said at the beginning, the relationships we want are on the other side of conversations we're avoiding. We all have this deep hunger put there by God to be loved and seen and known and the challenge living in our broken world is that those experiences on the, are on the other side of the things that we've been avoiding. Now, I'm not up here as somebody who has mastered this. I still get nervous when I share one of those vulnerable stories. 
And if I share one on a Sunday, I go into my office on Monday and hover my finger over the email inbox, wondering what I'm going to get. And one of the things that's been helpful for me is to sit down with people who are experts at relationships. And one of those people I'm going to invite out right now, she's my friend, Robin Kaufman. Would you give a round of applause? Good morning. Good morning, Robin. So if you don't know Robin, um, Robin has been here in Prescott for probably 10 or 15 years. Oh, it's going on over 17. 17, okay. Um, And she and her husband, Joey, uh, lead a ministry called 1010 Ministries that is designed to help leaders, especially couples, Mm -hmm. to strengthen their relationships and to navigate the things that come with leading. And so I met you guys when I moved to Prescott. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I began meeting with your husband, Joey. He's been my therapist for five years. God bless him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you started meeting with my wife, Danny, uh, mm-hmm. shortly after that. Um, and, and over the years, you've been a resource for me when I'm trying to navigate something and I kind of get stuck or I need some language mm-hmm. uh, or some tools around that. And so when I was working on this message, I said, hey, I think this would be better mm-hmm. if I brought in some help. And so Robin is going to help us today with what I'm called, calling vulnerability coaching. Now, you've heard the message now twice. Yeah. Um, what sticks out to you that you've heard today that I've shared? Well, it's the same that hit me that first um, service around that Genesis 3, when um, Adam and Eve become aware of their nakedness and their, their experience now is shame. Uh, what they were and never stopped being first before the shame got there was that they're sacred. They're made in the image of God, and they personally are sacred, and their relationship is sacred. And when sin entered the world, uh, the enemy has put a filter over their eyes and our eyes, so we first experience shame, and we forget our sacredness. So when you're talking about vulnerability, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bid that I have that, will you see the sacredness in me? Mm. I want to see the sacredness of you, but my shame, the door, I, I'm too scared to do that. And so I feel like this is such an important topic because we want this so bad, but we oftentimes don't know the how. So one of the things that you and Joey have taught me mm-hmm. is that vulnerability is essential to a healthy relationship. Yes. And what you've said, I've taken notes, is that we can only be loved to the extent we make ourselves known. Yes. We can only be loved to the extent we make ourselves known. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, definitely. So if the word vulnerability just feels very out there and big, just exchange it with, do you want to be known? Do you want to feel truly seen? It requires bringing yourself into the relationship, which requires vulnerability, which requires ultimately risk. And that's where a lot of us then put on the brakes. We're like, well, then that sounded good until that moment. Mm. Once I have to risk, because you may or may not receive me the way I'm hoping you will, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to risk that. And so truly, though, it is tied to you feeling loved. If you hold back letting someone else know you, let alone you knowing you, you having your own self-awareness, you looking past your shame to see what else is in there, that's what the enemy hopes you won't ever do. Mm. Um, you won't be able to give love or receive love the way Jesus even talked about it when the great commandment. Mm-hmm. Love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So know and be aware of all of you and love your neighbor as yourself. And so there's a direct correlation with knowing and loving, and it requires risk. So I I mentioned here, and I told my own story, Mm -hmm. a lot of us are really familiar with unhealthy vulnerability. Yes. Uh, We see that happen in our world, and we've experienced it, either given it or received it. What is required for healthy vulnerability Mm. to happen? Mm -hmm. Like if we were making a cake or making dinner, there's an ingredients list. What are the ingredients for healthy vulnerability? In a lot of ways, it's easy to point to what's not the right ingredient, uh, because that's where our hurt lies. Uh, So... Generally speaking, you need to have the right context and the right environment and uh, what we call in counseling language, emotional safety. 
And what I mean by that is being emotionally comfortable with the other person. We all have this experience. Like if you go into someone's home for the first time, within, what, two seconds, you can already tell just intuitively, is this the kind of home I can take off my shoes, put my feet on the couch, help myself to the refrigerator, or is this the kind of home where I am to like sit proper and, and just don't talk unless I'm talked to, right? You know that. Our souls are wired the same way. What we're looking for in relationships is our soul to feel at home in the presence of another person. Mm. Can I let down? Can I um, show you another part of me that um, I'm nervous to, but if I do, we might have a deeper relationship? We were having coffee a couple weeks ago, and you used a phrase that I'm not sure I'd ever heard before. Mm. You used a phrase with me, and the phrase is calculated vulnerability, Mm -hmm. which initially I kind of bristled that because I'm like, that kind of seems like I'm playing a game or it's not genuine, but you expressed this in a really, I think, helpful way. So what does calculated vulnerability do to help build a healthy relationship? Right. Well, let me, let me paint a picture I think we can all relate to. If we've had any experience on sho- social media, this would speak to like the wrong context. Some of us risk and test being known um, by posting something and hoping like you'll be seen, known, understood. And that, that, That is a um, dangerous form um, of vulnerability. A calculated vulnerability is uh, approaching the relationship in a, like a one-on-one situation, not not to the masses. Like that's not where intimacy is developed because what we're talking about is intimacy. Which is not just in terms of a couple and some sort of physical experience. Mm -hmm. Intimacy is a much bigger term. Our soul to feel seen and known and safe. And so calculated um, vulnerability, if I, I'm, I'm like object lesson person. Well, you, so. you guys bring up props when we yes. have therapy. I know I'm yes, going to need yes, yes, yes. Uh, help after that. So um, yeah, if, if I give you, this is okay. your hand and this is my hand and this is what I've been dealt with in life. Right. And so I might have, um, an opportunity to have a conversation with you and I don't know you very well. And so I'm going to give you maybe a three, like something that's not real of high value, and just put that out there and see what you do with that. If you do nothing, I'll, I'll just wonder, like maybe you didn't hear me, maybe you're feeling nervous, so maybe I'll, I'll up it a little to a four and see what you do with that. If you respond in a way that makes me feel like you're listening to me, um, that's called like a match. So maybe you have so something in your hand. maybe I have an eight. Oh, now, if you give me an eight, not only do I feel like you hear me, but you, you are matching my vulnerability and upping it. You match plus one me. Mm. And so that looks like, wow, when you said that you were having a really hard time over the holidays, if I'm being honest with you, I, I struggle a lot. I feel very alone and I feel like everyone wants me to be happy and I'm just trying to get out of bed. Not only did you hear me, but you you gave me something even more about you mm. and you matched me, which makes me say, you know what, that, that felt good. Um, I think I'm going to go there with you and I'm going to give you my face card. Mm. Well, you know why I felt so lonely is this is the first year without my loved one. And I just haven't even wanted to say that out loud. So you can see how you match, and you look for the match plus one. Hmm. And if I share something big like that with you, and you, your response is something like, well, aren't you over that by now? We've all been told really rough things. I, I'm not, I'm not going to give you any more of my cards. The other thing that happens sometimes is, if this is my hand, I'm so excited to get to know you. I think we're going to be best friends. Here's my whole life story. <laughs> In the first five minutes. <laughs> Has anyone experienced that? And then you're scared of me, and then you run off, and then I think, I've tried this. No one is ever there for me. Hmm. And we're not gauging. We're not, we're not calculating our vulnerability in a, in a healthy way. Now, I know as, as good as this is, yeah. there are some people here who are resisting it. Sure. And one of the things I often hear when I talk about vulnerability or mm-hmm. intimacy is, Scott, that's a, that's a woman thing. Yes. Dudes don't do vulnerability. Uh, yeah, right. So if dudes want intimacy, 
if they want to feel known in this world by even other men, not like your deepest, darkest secret, but like, I can be mean in front of you. You're not going to judge me. I feel like you're going to meet me with dignity and not condemnation. Like, we all have a need for that. That is not a gender-specific thing. We all have that need. Some of us aren't, just aren't willing to risk it. Or we go to the same channels for risk. We might, as a guy, you might only look to your wife and lump it under one category of intimacy and think that's going to fulfill what God designed for your entire soul to experience. Mm. So I would just say, actually, you have just as big a need, but... Um, it's up to you to explore what that looks like. Now, one of the things that um, this triggered in the first service mm -hmm. is there are some times where um, I'm worried about, like you were, playing my cards. Yeah. But then there's another part of it where I want to be the kind of person mm -hmm. that somebody can be vulnerable with. Yes. And I know at times that I may not be helpful. I may respond in the wrong way. I may say the wrong mm -hmm. thing. I may realize later, oh, that was what that was. I totally missed it. How can I be the kind of person that somebody's comfortable mm -hmm. playing their card in front of and responding well, how do I steward yeah. that moment? That's a great question because the other side of vulnerability is, is not that just you're looking for a safe person, but you got to be a safe person for mm. someone else. And so oftentimes what happens is you're holding your cards, I'm holding mine, and you're sharing something really to you risky. And I'm just like, what am I going to say next? What am I going to like? You're, you're thinking about your response that's not being a safe person. It's laying your cards down and tell me more. What was that like for you? I can remember a time, but I don't want to make it about me. So in fact, just tell me more. Mm. So, so becoming a safe person and not distracting yourself with your own pain. Um, being able to uh, sit in the awkwardness and the pain without just... Uh, using like there's a way to use scripture to edify and to encourage and bring hope and then there's another way to use scripture to to clean up the messiness so you don't feel uncomfortable mm. in a hard situation mm. and that's where i'd encourage you to be really locked in on what is that person asking of me right now maybe it's just silence and we forget we forget that if we feel nervous because we are being invited into someone's sacred place that we can just say this is hitting me deep i don't know how to respond to you but i want you to know i'm here mm. i want if you're okay with this um I, I i'm just not sure what to say like that's being vulnerable that's acceptable mm. you don't have to have an answer mm. and i think sometimes we want to feel like we gave the person something mm -hmm. but giving them our attention and dignity Dignity and compassion versus criticalness is huge. Well, I have to say, this has been super helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Las Vegas, so I love a good card analogy. <laughs> um, and I'm going to carry this with me. Um, you are doing a great job at creating tools like this. Yeah. And so I'm going to share a link with the church in a sure. little bit to where they can learn more mm -hmm. about that. Uh, unfortunately, you have done so well uh, with helping people that your capacity like all of us have a capacity yeah. is full right now. So yeah. you're not accepting I'm, new clients. No, but you do have, there's some places people can work with you in yeah. a different way mm -hmm. that we'll share online. And then um, we live in a great town with some great resources. And so um, I'll also share with them some other people Excellent. that are just as awesome as you are that they could work with. Yeah. So thanks for carving yeah, out some time bet. on your Sunday to be with us. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Well, in the same way that Robin gave us some tips and some next steps, I want to give you some next steps this morning. If you're new here, these are in the back of your handout. And the first one is this. I want to encourage you to identify at least one person who feels safe in your life. Now, Robin said this is safety in terms of you feel comfortable. You can be at home with them. You can take your shoes off. And I just encourage you, you don't always know somebody's safe, but often you've got a hunch. And you want to test that hunch. And so I'd encourage you, maybe the first thing you do today is the name of a person. Write it down there on your handout. Who's one person that you think you might be able to go there with? The second next step is to brainstorm the best environments to increase vulnerability. And this is one of those places I want to speak to that gender um, stereotype. I have found that sometimes men and women are vulnerable in different environments. Sometimes there are some people, and it could be a man or woman, who's vulnerable in a restaurant or a coffee shop. 
and that's great. Other times, you're vulnerable when you're doing something or you're going somewhere and you're not face-to-face, but you're side-by-side. You're taking a drive, you're working on a project. The universal uh, kind of uh, catalyst for vulnerability I've discovered is fire. A fire pit, a campfire. There's something about the darkness and a fire that I just see again and again bringing out that vulnerability. So think about what are the places that I could put myself in and be with that person who's possibly safe that we might be able to be vulnerable in together. Third, pray and ask God to be strong in the place you are weak. I know a lot of us don't like feeling weak, thinking about weak, talk about being weak, but 2 Corinthians 12 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and there Paul says, God, it is in my weakness that you are strong. Your grace is sufficient for me, for your power is actually made perfect in my weakness. So if you want to experience God's perfection, the requirement is that you bring and you step into your weakness. So before you go there with somebody, pray and say, God, would you be strong in this place where I am weak? And then finally, we've created a tool for you this week. It's called a vulnerability starter guide, and it's got some some prompts to help you begin this conversation. That link for that is on your handout on the back, and it's prescottcornerstone.com slash sermon hyphen resources. It's got a link to some things that Robin is creating that you might be able to take advantage of. It's also got a link to a list of counselors in our community that we recommend if that's something you feel like is a next step for you. All of those resources are at that link right there. Now, I know some of you have this well-built-in pattern that as soon as I give the last next step, you put your stuff down. And that's great. I want you to do that right now. But once you put them down, I want you to bring your attention back here. So if, you're, if you have your phone out, your, your notes out, your journal out, just set it down. And I want to make sure that, that we, you don't walk away with the wrong idea. I believe that relationships are an essential part of how God made us. As, as God said in Genesis 2, it is not good for man to be alone. But that brokenness and that sin and that shame that entered our world in Genesis 3, it will not be healed just because you find a friend. It will not be changed just because you find somebody who gets you. That'll be a huge part of God working in your life, but no person, even your spouse, can save you. They can't redeem you. They can't transform you. I gave you a a flow, a pattern earlier that I want to revisit. And the pattern was that we pull away. We feel shame. We fear pain. And then we build bigger barriers. That's the problem pattern. Here's the solution pattern. Jesus pursued us. We pulled away from God, starting in the garden and ever since, and the good news is that Jesus said, I'm coming after you. He came and he took on all our shame. There is nothing about your life in the present or the past that God does not know. You are completely known by God. And the good news is that you are completely loved. He came and he died on the cross because he loved you and he took on the weight of your shame and your sin. And because of that, I can declare today that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. And the good news is because there's no condemnation, Jesus has come and he's torn down the barrier between us. So if there's a barrier between you and God that is as high as a castle and as big and deep as a moat, Jesus has come to scale that, to cross that, and to break that down. And that's the hope we have in the places where we feel scared to be vulnerable and ashamed. So what do we do? What's our response? Well, we have an opportunity to move towards Jesus. He pursues us And we have an opportunity to step towards him. We have an opportunity to give him our shame. To take the good and the bad of our lives. The moments we're proud of and the moments we're ashamed of. All of those things that are what being known includes. And we have an opportunity to trust these with Jesus. 
give them to him. I mean, after all, he already knows, right? And to trust him with our pain. And in that place, we find true healing. That's where the healing comes. And then when a person who is also experiencing true healing, who's also trusting God with their pain, who's also given him their shame, and who's also moving towards Jesus, we can then find our people who are experiencing the same thing and going in the same direction. That's the hope that we've gathered here today to celebrate. He's the hero of the story. And that's the hope that we have. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Jesus, we thank you so much that you don't meet us in the places that we thought our life was going to end up in or wish we were. You meet us where we are. Sometimes that's behind a locked door or within a giant castle. Some of us are carrying deep shame and deep pain and walking around with real fear. But we thank you that like the prodigal son who ran away and the father was waiting and anticipating for the son to return, you have been pursuing us. Like the shepherd who went after the one lost sheep, you pursued us. You made it possible for us to come home to you, for us to be healed and transformed and forgiven. And as we figure out what it means to be in healthy relationships with people, I pray that you would begin to do healing in terms of our relationship with you. I pray that we would turn and run towards you knowing that you have taken all of that shame away so that we can experience all of the love that you have for us. In your name we pray, amen.